And finally, hydrophytes, which are uh, water plants, hydro being water. Uh, these are plants that are adapted to freshwater habitats. Now, let's start with hydrophytes. We're going to go from the bottom, well, yeah, from the bottom up. So hydrophytes, these are plants that are only going to grow in or on water, or at least in uh, very watery environments. For example, uh, water lilies uh, or cloud forests, for example. Uh, so this is the undersurface of a tree fern, for example. Um, they'll have an extremely high number of stomata per unit area. Uh, this is going to live in a cloud forest where there's a very moist environment. Uh, now. These will have high number of stomata in order to account the, that increases the surface area for diffusion to make up for the low, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the non-steep concentration gradient, the shallow concentration gradient, as it were, for the, uh, the shallow concentration gradient between the inside of the leaf and the exterior environment. Now, Mesophytes is pretty much what we've been experiencing and talking about this entire time so far. These are terrestrial plants that are adapted for neither particularly dry nor particularly wet environments. And yes, this is a four-leaf clover. Yes, they are real. It's just a rare mutation of a real plant. So three-leaf clovers are the norm. Four-leaf clovers is something like a one in 10,000 mutation. Um, it exists. It's a real thing. All right. Now, xerophytes. These are plants that need very little water. Um, now, we can study xerophytes, and these are a, um, a study in reducing water loss. So some common examples of ways to reduce water loss, uh, having smaller leaves to reduce surface area, uh, pine trees, for example. Uh, now, you wouldn't think that pine trees would be an example of a xerophyte, a dry plant, because you wouldn't think of pine trees as existing in a dry environment. But then again, snow is not exactly readily available water. It's frozen. So that means that that's water that you just have to let go. So uh, now, <clears throat> that means that small leaves reducing the surface area, that means a pine tree will have water, uh, will be, have a xerophytic adaptation that reduces the water loss through transpiration because it doesn't have readily available water. Water that's not in liquid form for it to absorb through its roots, to go through its stem, into its leaves, to transpire. Densely packed spongy mesophyll, that will reduce the surface area inside the leaf um, that will allow for less water to evaporate into the airspace within the leaf. Uh, that's a good way. Uh, thickened waxy cuticles, such as on holly leaves, that will reduce evaporation. That's another northern plant that um, is in a snowy environment. Um, when water availability is low, you close stomata. That is a way that you can um, reduce water loss, not necessarily uh, in just xerophytic plants, but any plant. Um, also, other types of adaptations, hairs on the surface of the leaf, um, to trap the layer of air close to the surface, which can become saturated with water, and that will reduce the, the rate of diffusion by um, uh, shallowing out the, uh, the concentration gradient. Uh, also, putting the stomata in pits that will become saturated with water vapor, that will reduce the, uh, the concentration gradient steepness. Um, that will reduce the diffusion, uh, rate of diffusion. Rolling the leaves so that the lower epidermis is not exposed to the atmosphere. That will also trap the air. That will become saturated. Uh, that will main uh, also maintaining high salt concentrations. That will keep the water potential low, preventing water from leaving because water follows salt. Um, in big letters across the screen, right here, follow salt. Um, so now, some xerophytes. May, now, once again, all the things that we said in the previous slide, they're not hard and fast rules. You don't have to follow every single one of them. For example, some xerophytes might have a lot of stomata, because you can't just say, no stomata ever, because plants still need to convert carbon dioxide into sugars. 
you still need to exchange carbon dioxide. You have to have stomata. Um, xerophyte cells might need to have extra support to prevent cells from collapsing when they dry out because drying out may still occur. Um, you can have all the protection against water loss that you like, but you are still in an extraordinarily dry environment, and water loss may occur to the point where you will dry out, and a dry season above and beyond that which you are uh, prepared to deal with may still occur, and that means that when you dry out, you need to prevent collapse. So, additional protections. Also, um, other adaptations for the plant itself, um, like an extensive root system, to help collect all the available water in the surrounding environment may exist. Um, leaves may also have become spines, for example, in cactuses, uh, cacti, excuse me. Um, and in the stems, the stems may have become thickened in order to store water. That is an example of cacti. So in a cactus, you may not have noticed the leaves, but all those spines that uh, you uh, got embedded into you when you hugged your cactus friends, uh, which I don't recommend uh, because they're not very good huggers. Um, they, uh, those, those stems are thickened in order to uh, hold on to water, and the leaves themselves are thickened uh, spines. They are thin spikes. So these, there we go. So xerophytes, they'll, have, they'll typically have thickened cuticles to stop uncontrolled evaporation through the leaf cells. Uh, they'll have a small leaf surface area, which will uh, have less of surface area for evaporation. So conifer needles and cactus spines are the examples of this. They'll have low stomatal density. That will decrease, the, that will decrease uh, your surface area for diffusion. Um, Sunken stomata will maintain humid air around the stomata, so in marrow grass and cacti, for example. Um, stomatal hairs called trichores or trichomes, excuse me, um, they maintain humid air around the stomata, uh, such as in marrow grass or couch grass. Uh, rolled leaves will maintain humid air around the stomata, such as in marrow grass. Uh, extensive roots to maximize water uptake, like in cacti. Now. Um, let me draw a uh, diagram of what I mean for some of these. So, in your leaf, you have, this is your leaf, and these blue dots are going to be your water. To prevent your water from escaping through the top of the leaf, you're going to want a thickened cuticle. That will prevent water from escaping through the top of the plant. The water can't escape through the top. So you'll have preventing the water from leaving through above the plant. Now, every once in a while, you'll still need stomata on the underside of this leaf. And so, these stomata are going to release water through them out into the open. But what if we put these stomata in pits? Now, all of a sudden, these pitted stomata now have a concentration of a lot of dots here and a lot of dots here. 
Now this gradient is not so high, is not so steep between this versus this out here. Now the movement of water vapor is not going to be as fast out of the leaf and into this space. It's the same idea as putting hairs. Hairs there. That's going to prevent the water from escaping out into the atmosphere. Now, that will keep this concentration high and all the water that escapes into this area is going to just pile up, preventing further water loss into this area. Now, if this keeps up, what if I then roll my leaf? If I roll my leaf, then any of the water molecules that get out are still going to be trapped inside and still can't get out to the atmosphere out here, where all the wind is. So I still have a, a shallow concentration gradient inside this leaf. I maintain a shallow concentration gradient, and all the water stays inside this leaf, is prevented from leaving. I am keeping all that water inside the leaf. I am making barriers upon barrier, upon barrier, upon barrier, from the water getting out. I need to keep that water inside this leaf, because the more water that gets out of this leaf, the less water I have inside this leaf for the stuff that I need to do inside this leaf, like chemical reactions that need to exist inside of an aqueous solution, which is all of them. Now, so here's some cacti, some pretty ones and some that are, well, ugly. I'll let you determine which ones I think are which. Um, now, these are uh, scanning electron micrographs of cacti, of the, uh, sur of the surface of cacti. Uh, this is the thickened cuticle. This is a knife through cross section. So it shows this deep uh, epidermis countersunk of the cuticle. It shows the stomata uh, guard cells here and here. And it shows the uh, underlying tissues of this Rhipsalis dissimilis cactus. Now, here is a uh, transverse section through a plant. This is showing us this sunken pit and these trichome hairs. Trichome with an M. So these hairs are preventing the evaporation of water from uh, are preventing the uh, this escape of water vapor after it has exited through these uh, stomata from the air spaces here. Now we have multiple upper epidermal layers, this hypodermis layer. A thickened hypodermis is another adaptation of xerophytes that prevent that prevents water loss. Thickened epidermis and uh, multiple layers of epidermis and multiple layers of hypodermis um, is another adaptation. And it just increases the distance that water needs to travel in order to escape through any other route besides the stomata. Now, marum grass is a common example used by Cambridge. Um, British marum grass. Uh, and when it's dry outside, the leaves roll up so that the stomata will only open to an enclosed space. 
and water vapor will accumulate into this space, which reduces the diffusion gradient. The spines will increase the width of the boundary layer, uh, and that will, um, and this is effectively mutated Pac-Man. So our leaf is rolled up, and this traps the air inside the leaf. We have trichome hairs here. We have a thickened epidermis, a thickened hypodermis. We have uh, vascular bundles throughout here. We have a low density of stomata. We have a thickened cuticle all around here. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other adaptations that reduce the surface area, uh, uh, sorry, that reduce the, uh, um, sorry, the somata being sunken in pits that reduce the water potential gradient, water vapor potential gradient. So here is marrow grass in its natural habitat. More marrow grass. A close up of marrow grass, which looks well like a death metal band cover, album cover. Um, more death metal album covers. Um, more mutated Pac Man. Um, all right, now. Let's move on back to a discussion about the movement of sugars in a plant. So we're going to talk now about translocation. So translocation is the movement of assimilates. Assimilates being the things that are going to become assimilated into the plant. So a source is a part of the plant that releases sucrose to the phloem uh, and the example, the best example is the leaf. The sink is the part of the plant that removes the sucrose from the flow. A root is the best example thereof. So translocation is always going to occur from source to sink. Phloem will always move, um, assimilates from source to sink. Now, this is a pretty picture example of source to companion cell to phloem to companion cell to sink. Now, leaf and root are our most common examples, but there are other examples of sinks. Um, and uh, the source is not always a leaf. Sometimes during the uh, during the uh, post-winter season, um, when plants need to regrow from their dead parts, from their, uh, when they've died down to the roots, they need to regrow from whatever was left behind. So they've used